actually create uh, <coughs> create uh, uh, sustainable livelihoods for our people. The theme uh, 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 for this workshop is very, very impo uh, uh, imperative. Na uh, this is a national high-level policy dialogue on the state of the economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the journey to economic recovery for Uganda is not smooth at all. And this is because of the impact of COVID-19, which came with the lockdown of the economy, uh, not only Uganda's economy, but uh, the global economy, climate change, and the global processes that uh, affect us, for example, the war in, uh, 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 in Ukraine, between Russia and Ukraine, which actually is a third world war now. I know someone will be talking about the impact of that war in depth, but we are, <clears throat> we are receiving the shocks of that war and it's affecting the global economy. Actually, analysts are warning of tough times it's, uh, uh, in Africa. Uh, some, of them, the, uh, some of them are predicting that we are likely to experience demonstrations for rising food prices and some turbulence. Already, can, uh, this is being experienced in Senegal, in Sudan, in South Sudan, in Ethiopia, and yesterday, the, the Kenyan government deployed the army uh, to combat ethnic violence in Basabit, one of the counties uh, uh, in the northeast of that country. And it's because of the impact of climate change, occasioned now by drought and the hunger, and of course, the struggle for, uh, for water and pasture among the communities. <clears throat> the global economy is not looking any better, as my colleague uh, has uh, already pointed out. America is experiencing the worst uh, uh, high commodities or uh, levels of inflation in 40 years. And actually yesterday they adjusted the, the inflation rate. Uh, of course, as we said, uh, the, 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 the rising commodities occasioned by uh, the war in Ukraine because of wheat. Ukraine and Russia produce about 40% of the wheat that is consumed around the world. I know the president has suggested uh, uh, a coping mechanism, uh, and that is cassava, uh, uh, which we have in print anyway. I hope we'll take it in good faith and try to adapt, because people who don't adapt and mitigate can perish. So I think we take that advice in good faith uh, and see how we can adapt and, and survive. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> China, uh, which is a main actually donor around the world and actually in this country, its economy has been doing well and is uh, rebounding. But COVID has caused some of its uh, cities to be locked, and that has an, imp uh, an implication uh, uh, on, on, on the trade and its, uh, uh, its aid to the developing world. So uh, uh, on one hand, some good news, but on the other, COVID-19 resurgence in China has had an impact. On the, on the, uh, on the East African outlook, the, it, is, it is also difficult to predict, especially the East African community. Uh, we see recent processes that including, uh, include the reopening of the Rwanda-Uganda border is a promising thing. Uh, now trade is going on, but remember that most of the trade the, the, the traders had been decimated. We are just, they are just recovering now, and the volume of trade is just is still small. But also, uh, you know that the, the whole peace process of reopening of the border has not been made official. It is still actually unofficial, which is good, but it needs to be made official for it to be sustained. It needs to be codified in some treaty, uh, not just a, a friendship. So, so we can see that's a glimmer of hope but until it is codified, it is made official, you still cannot. So we need to, to move. Uh, uh, one of the recommendations I, I will be making here is that we need to trade amongst ourselves in East Africa, but that, and that reopening of the border needs to be made uh, very official. The admission of DRS Congo in the, in, the, in, the, in the East African community, very good news, opening up trade. We have almost 90 million people joining the community. But we also know that the DR Congo also comes with baggage. It's a member, it has a membership of other trading organized uh, 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 blocks, and that could be a conduit actually of getting uh, dumping from the member uh, and, uh, and uh, the director here. I think it is important to take note that most of us seem to be very happy that Congo has joined 
the East African community, but could also be conduit for dumping. Uh, so we need to be careful. The, the, another beam of hope comes from the oil and gas sector and the progress made by this country. Uh, we expect by 2025 oil to flow. But uh, uh, so that would attract foreign direct invest investment, which may boost our, 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 our foreign direct investment and, uh, 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 in this country. But also it has its own uh, challenge. The fact that the countries of the world are moving from the brown economy to the green economy. Now, most of our hope, the oil and the gas is a part of the brown economy that doesn't respect nature, that also has its own impact. So we need actually to green the whole processes, otherwise we may destroy the environment and create adverse conditions for climate change. So some hope, but with caution. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the opening of the schools is a glimmer of hope, as schools provide the market for most of our produce and, and other commodities, but we also, we also have been warned by the detractors like Bill Gates that we are expecting another bad variant of COVID-19 and that this one is going to be merciless. I've just, I, I, had, I was attacked twice. I'm a survivor of COVID-19. It is bad for some of you who, who survived, uh, but it is very bad. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm also uh, hopeful uh, uh, because government has also designed the, the, the parish development model. It's another gleam of hope. The parish model uh, 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 is intended to create economic inclusion of majority of our citizens. But the parish development model is not a silver bullet. It will also depend on how it is well designed, it's, well, uh, it's, uh, it's received, and how it's going to be implemented. The other, child, the other issue that I, uh, we talk about, yes, I'm told Uganda is smart in managing the, the debt, but I think there's a, raise, a raising debt burden, and, and actually, <coughs> That is not a good thing. We may bequeath the, the succeeding generations with a debt burden. So debt management, debt sustainability is going to be very, very important if this country is going to recover very fast and, uh, and, 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 and go on the road to sustainable development. Climate investment in climate change, adaptation and mitigation, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is also very, very, very critical. As I wind up, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, this... This, uh, uh, this dialogue has the following objectives. And uh, one of the objectives was to, was to create an opportunity for the government through the Ministry of Finance to tell us some of the interventions that government is coming up with for recovery and sustainable development. So we expect, uh, ladies and gentlemen, flank and honest discussion on this. But secondly, to provide an opportunity for non stake actors and other stakeholders to also make co to contribute to the various policy options that government can take. And on this note, I want to ask our colleagues in the government to be open and receptive of new ideas, innovative ideas that could situation, situate our economy and we take off as, a, as a, the Minister Kasaja talks, uh, talks about that we are now. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank you for listening uh, to me for coming, and uh, I know we have an audience uh, uh, that will be reaching us virtually. Ladies and gentlemen, we will welcome your ideas. Uh, this is an, uh, a free space. And finally, to thank really the Minister of Finance again for being open, receptive to ideas of civil society to contribute to the development of our country. I thank you for listening. Give us another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Dr. Arthur Bainomujisha, for setting the stage for us to have a discussion. And uh, I've been advised that maybe you don't need to come on the podium because it is easier technically for you to sit and talk from where you are. So may I now invite Mr. Julius Mukunda, Executive Director, CS Bag, for also to give us the opening remarks. Julius, the microphone is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Good morning, everyone, uh, for those uh, here and those are listening online. Uh, thanks, Arthur, my brother, for uh, the opening remarks, uh, which I, I, I share with you that we are in uh, circumstances where we need to see what we can do. Uh, let me rec uh, recognize uh, all protocols observed here, but especially for me, for Mr. Kagwa, who is representing the PSST, because there is nobody 
better than Mr. Kagwa who can tell us what uh, the, the, the economy is facing. He's our chief economist of government, director of economic affairs, and I'm very sure that uh, he, he has a lot he has been cooking, and uh, we look forward for, for what we can share with him. Prices have increased. That's a fact. Soap, you know, cooking oil, uh, fuel, and we can look for all the reasons why these have increased. We can talk about the war in Ukraine. We can talk about labor shortages during COVID. Uh, but one thing also which is coming up is that actually because there is this increasing use of biodiesel that is also actually likely to cause some shortages in one way or the other. But even when we talk about all these challenges, I think it's also important to say, what are we going to do about these challenges? And I think for me this is very important, that these challenges will continue coming. I mean, we can't stop it. Nobody, you can't stop the war in Ukraine, we can't stop COVID. But I think the most important part is, as, as an ordinary citizen, is what is your government doing to cushion you and prevent, uh, you know, to prevent uh, uh, such a negative impact on your daily life? Like I've said before, the person staying in Koboko probably is not aware about Ukraine and Russia. He's not aware about supply chain uh, disruptions. They don't know about those ones. But maybe all they care about is if I've been roasting, my, have been uh, cooking my chapati, how come all of a sudden I can't see wheat and the cooking oil is very high? So I, I think that the government, we need definitely to be able to, to look at that and see what, uh, what, what, what we can do. But I, I think for me is to look ahead and see maybe what, what, what should we do and maybe where have we gone wrong in terms of ensuring that we cushion ourselves from these externalities. Because when we look at what is happening, most of these things actually it is just imported, uh, most of the, of the goods and services, uh, the, pr the price increase is mostly from imported uh, commodities. That, has, that is affecting again what we are doing internally. First of all, I think for me is when we talk about reserves, everybody is thinking about the oil reserves. But we still need to think about our granaries in the villages, at the village level, at the sub county level, at the district level. What kind of system are we put, put in place to have those national food reserves? Because if we had a plan for that, then this is the time now would be relying on some of these particular, uh, particular reserves. And I think that's something that our Minister of Agriculture, with support from finance, we need to start thinking about how can we put in place the food, the national food reserves. Of course, we are not forgetting about the, the, the petroleum reserves. I mean, these, these are also definitely needed to cushion us from this uh, 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 supply chain disruptions that cause increase in prices. The, the, the other element I think for me is on our import substitution strategy. I think this is very important because if you look at the number of commodities we are importing, then you, you ask yourself why we can't do it. Wheat, you know, rice, you know, onions, you know, potatoes, sorghum, palm oil, these are some of the things we can definitely produce as a country. And in a way, they could caution us from that, some of these price disruptions. So what strategy do we have in the place to ensure? He should catch up that one, I think. He's, he's, <laughs> he's busy. <laughs> okay, so I think for me is. So I, I think for me is again it's cri very critical that we address issues around imports. What are we importing that we can produce locally, and put resources there and then? Among the things that are causing also these uh, price disruptions is of course the black market, that people are hoarding some of these products. And, and I think it's very important that we look at stringent regulations in terms of uh, people who are holding products so that they can have, the prices can increase. And strengthening the regulations definitely on the competition and consumer protection would go a long way 
in ensuring that we have some sort of st price stability. Uh, lastly, for me, I think it's a question around technology capability uh, to be able to deal with unpredictable and unfavorable weather. We've just had our, our water, uh, water week, uh, and if you could see what other countries are doing and what we are doing, you can definitely see that we are lagging behind. In fact, a, guy, a person from Israel was saying that plants don't need the soil to grow, and everybody's in a shock. They need nutrients. And he was able to demonstrate how they have greenhouses that have no soil but nutrients. And they were having the best tomatoes uh, in, in the country. So f for me, I think a question of helping our farmers, you know, to reduce, on, on, to, reduce uh, to increase yields, reduce on post-harvest losses, is very critical for us to be able to have our own food. Because we are already lucky that some of these things can also, uh, can also be, uh, be addressed. So... I look forward for this discussion. Again, I thank Minister of Finance for this opportunity so we can have uh, a joint discussion and dialogue. We all belong to this country. Nobody wants to be uh, a refugee somewhere else. So that at least at the end of the day, we can also enjoy the opportunities that are there and we can also be well. Thank you so much. I think we can uh, give Mr. Julius Mukunda a bigger round of applause. Thank you so much. And I was listening very keenly I, uh, for the things you're telling us. What can we do as a country, even though the economic situation seems to be global? Some things are not in our control. There's some form of imported inflation, I suppose. But what can we do? And he talked about substitution. What is it that we can produce ourselves here? There has always been a... I've heard the president talk about that maybe we can... Uh, he was giving advice, the Muwogo advice. <laughs> and then how do we stop hoarding and uh, work on a competitive and competitive advantage as a country, what we have that is in our control? Because if we went to agriculture, and I'm sure did it so well, we can make sure that no other country in the region can even dare to compete because we have everything in our favor. Um, I don't know whether my shoes are big enough to invite the, the Director of Economic Affairs. Uh, so for that matter, it is just going to be a singular honor I'm, I'm giving back to you, Dr. Bainom Jisha, to invite our keynote speaker to speak to us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, our moderator. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have the Director of Economic Affairs, uh, Mr. Kagwa, uh, who is representing the Permanent Secretary and the Secretary and the uh, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Ramadan Gobi, and uh, we want to appreciate you, Director, uh, because we know that the, actually in the recent past the economy has done well. The shilling has remained stable, and uh, 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 these shocks, most of them, uh, are from outside, and certainly that's the work of the Minister of Finance, Bank of Uganda and those coordinated efforts. So uh, without wasting much of our time, it is my single, singular honor uh, to invite you to give a keynote address, and thereafter we will discuss it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aitha Bainomgisha, uh, Mr. Julius Mukunda, uh, Patrick Kamara, I've seen uh, Honorable Ken Ucham is the man, so it's a pleasure having him around. Uh, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I need to convey the apologies of the uh, Permanent Secretary, Secretary to Treasury, Mr. Ramadan Gobi, who has been uh, summoned to attend another equally important um, meeting, so he delegated me to stand in for him. Uh, well, I was going to just uh, talk about the state of the economy and then the rising uh, prices. But uh, from what I have heard, uh, I think we need to uh, put it in context because uh, I know uh, when we go to church or to the mosque every time, uh, the priests of God are telling us uh, not to sin. They are reminding us that this is what is there. So I think I'll, I'll just start 
by talking about uh, the problems where they have started uh, with the COVID-19. Uh, really, this was uh, impacted on us, but it has it generally impacted on the whole world. We have seen uh, that we've lost our loved ones. Uh, in the world, I think we have uh, a total of um, more than one million um, uh, people dying. Actually, it's a world total of 6.23 million souls which have lost, and we're still counting. And then in Uganda, we've lost about 3,597 people. Um, and also, the COVID-19 disrupted our economy and uh, led to higher inflation in some countries. And um, when we see what it has done, it has plagued uh, humankind to an unprecedented scale. Because most of these uh, pandemics were in particular regions, but we saw that uh, COVID-19 affected the entire planet. There's no country which was immune from that. Um, of course, at the peak, or at, the, at its peak, the global economic growth declined to minus 3.1 percent. That is in 2020. Uh, when you look at the global growth, which was to 2019, you saw that also in Uganda's case, we had been growing at about 6 percent. And we are thinking of, uh, of growing faster than that. But uh, because of it, uh, we declined to 2.9 percent. And um, our labor force, if you know it, uh, declined with many workers moving from modern and semi-modern sectors into subsistence agriculture. The share of working persons in subsistence agriculture increased from 41 percent to 52% before and after the outbreak of the pandemic. What does this really mean? That people who were getting money in their pockets had gone now to produce for what we call chidachonka, for the stomach. And uh, when you look at uh, the situation now, that also tells you that uh, we don't have the resilience to be able to counter the rising prices because there is no uh, money that, uh, that uh, the people have to be able to spend. If you find an economy which is mostly formal, and as long as people have jobs, you are looking at the US, for example. They have had inflation. The worst inflation is in 40 years, much more than ours. But uh, people are not suffering so much, much with the increasing prices because they have jobs. So the jobs are taking care of that. But in our case here, you find that the problem is that a lot of people are in subsistence agriculture. Uh, we have also experienced uh, revenue shortfalls in the past two years that were unprecedented, 2.5 trillion. Yet expenditure needs increased to finance the fight against COVID-19 enforcement of COVID-19 uh, protocols uh, to keep Ugandans alive. So all these things really happened. And then when we see that the economy is opening up, what are the problems? Because now we've talked about schools opening up, tourism has opened up, there's an excitement. But then uh, we ask ourselves, one, what is it that now the economy has opened? Why do we see these increasing commodity prices? Hmm? Um, but uh, economists, uh, I think, know that it takes time for external shocks to manifest themselves. Um, and in this case, they have started with prices of essential items. So now we are seeing the shocks. It's not that it's now, but uh, there is a lag. And then when they come, you start seeing them. The first thing are the essential items, like uh, uh, particularly laundry bus soap, fuel, cooking oil, building materials uh, like cement. They have also gone up and steel. 
and then some food items, and also we noticed that education services uh, prices had gone up. As a result, our inflation has increased to 3.7% in March 2021. I will later elaborate why the current prices with Uganda uh, feeling the inflation of 3% is unbearable, is perhaps one of the key uh, ingredients in what we are trying to do as a ministry. Um, of course, the causes of the increase in commodity prices are largely external and supply side related. Um, key of which is the, is the effect of COVID-19 restrictions, which disrupted supply chains worldwide, um, leading to higher transport costs, shortage of shipping containers, uh, shortage of raw materials, and higher fuel prices. This cocktail has curtailed smooth manufacturing, production, and movement of goods and services, leading to increased commodity prices. Just want to give you an example that uh, we used to get our crude palm oil for making soap and cooking oil from Malaysia. With the disruptions, first of all, there were disruptions. We couldn't uh, get it out. Then there was less production because during the COVID, there were people were not going to the plantation, so there was less production. And uh, because with the opening up, all economies wanted the same thing at the same time. There was more demand than the supply that was there. So that led to an increase uh, in the prices. And of course, uh, that has a pass-through effect from us who are importers of our crude palm oil. We witnessed that uh, the prices had actually gone up. Um, uh, since the crisis are like taxis. Uh, another one is often uh, on the way as one leaves the stage. You see the taxis, how they move. And now the other crisis is the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Of course, it emerged as we are saying, yes, it's okay, we are coming out of uh, COVID. Then, um, and this has also further disrupted um, uh, the supply of goods such as oil, wheat, maize, and sunflower oil, as, low, uh, uh, as well as raw materials. These two countries are what we call major uh, producers as, uh, and exporters of these commodities. Uh, we, we actually get 70% of our wheat from Ukraine and Russia. So if you combine the two of them, those are the biggest uh, uh, suppliers to us. So you wouldn't be surprised why the price of wheat flour is going up because uh, there's been that disruption. Mm. Um, <clears throat> as I've said before, that the current spike in prices are one, supply related, two, external, and three, uh, we, we, uh, they are global. So what, what should be the government response? Um, one, we are concentrating on the following. To, uh, we are ensuring that we, we maintain a competitive environment to, sup to support a continuous supply of the goods and services whose stream is currently constrained. That is fuel, soap, cooking oil, cement, uh, steel, etc. And, vo and avoid creating more shortages. Because it's, uh, people are saying, what is government doing? Yes, we are trying to avoid creating shortages. The prices may go up, but at least if the goods are there, yeah, some people can get them, they can get them in, uh, they can consume them less. But that is one of the things that we as government, we think, um, are doing. Then, um, we, we, we have heard that um, we, we, we should, uh, maybe government should come in and um, subsidize, remove taxes, and also subsidize some of these uh, products. Subsidies uh, are good if you can, uh, with certainty, 
um, estimate how long a crisis is going to last and if also your pocket is deep enough. Uh, we, we have seen it in some of our neighboring countries. They have uh, the, the subsidized fuel, and they reached a time when they didn't have a fuel because the subsidy had run out. And then they went to get, uh, uh, they, 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 they got uh, a loan through a, uh, through a supplementary to finance. But how long is this one going to go on? because you don't know when the crisis is going to end. So uh, we, are, we are trying to say, yes, everybody is saying, what is government doing? Why don't we remove the taxes? Why don't we uh, subsidize? But look at it that, the other side. Already, as uh, uh, Arthur said, our debt is ballooning, and it was caused uh, because of those two years. It was very bad when we experienced COVID. So we want to contain the debt. So how do you contain the debt and you offer a subsidy when you don't have uh, revenues coming in? So uh, that is the uh, delegate balance that government has to, uh, to undertake to ensure that at least the economy does not uh, 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 go under because some of these things could actually lead, uh, lead us to uh, a recession, and that's what we are trying to avoid. Um, we are also supporting farmers to grow more food to ensure that we do not suffer food shortages. And when you look at what uh, drives uh, inflation in Uganda, fi uh, food is actually a big driver. And when you look at most of the households, especially the poor households, they spend a lot of their money on food. So if we, are to, uh, if we encourage people to, to, and we support them to grow more food, we think this will help alleviate the plight that they are, they are, they are facing. Um, we are also facilitating more exports to take advantage of the shocks. Because if you don't have uh, exports, then your exchange rate will depreciate, and then you will have more imported inflation. So those are the things that we as government are really uh, looking at going forward. But when we also look at our economy, um, as I try to summarize, I think I've talked a lot, um, our economy is growing. Our, the size of our economy was Uganda shillings, 147.649 trillion by December 2021, which is, about, which is an equivalent of US dollars, 41.7 billion. But at the end of this financial year, we project that uh, our economy will have um, grown to 153.85 trillion, which is an equivalent of 44.17 billion. In this year, we expect the economy to grow at 4.5%, and then in next year, it will grow at 6%. And uh, the driver of this growth is public investments and the rebound in economic activities since the reopening of the economy. We are seeing that coming in. Um, we are also seeing, we are seeing manufacturing uh, picking up, and then there is an um, increase in, uh, in agriculture production and productivity, and we are going to really move it around the parish development model, the continued government investment in infrastructure, energy, industrial parks, growth in IC sector, and then the oil uh, production related activities. Government is actually moving to ensure that we as much as possible curtail what we call wasteful expenditure. And um, we are looking at, for example, this year's budget. From the budgets of uh, the different uh, votes, we have saved 1.6 trillion, which we are using to repurpose uh, the budget and focus it into the areas that will drive this economy that will get the 39% uh, of the households that are right now in subsistence out of this situation. So that's where we're moving. I've already talked about the inflation. It remains low because we have not suffered a lot uh, of food inflation. But uh, you, we, we have seen inflation in other countries like the US, which has accelerated to 8.5% in March 2022, which is the highest recorded in 40 years. The UK inflation has increased to 7%. The 
the highest recorded since May 1992. So we have seen also in other economies, emerging economies like Brazil, the inflation is 11.3%, India 6.9%, then you look at Kenya 6.3%, Rwanda 7.5%. So as uh, Dr. Bainom Gesha said, it's not just uh, something for Uganda. All these uh, things are affecting all of us. Uh, on, on, um, as I've said before, that we shall continue to promote a free and fair competitive environment. I'm just reiterating this, to support a continuous supply of all the goods that are coming in. That's what we want. But at the same time, um, we, are <coughs> we are trying also to increase our revenues for next year. We are not increasing taxes. So that should be uh, something that is good for this country. Every, everybody is decrying, uh, increasing taxes, increasing taxes. So as we are getting into recovery, we have said, let's not increase uh, taxes so that uh, uh, production can, uh, can, can grow and that at least people can recover. We have provided some funding, though it hasn't yet uh, worked. We, we, we have established the Small Business Recovery Fund of 200 billion, which is under, which is managed by Bank of Uganda, with uh, participating supervised financial institutions. This is supposed to help the small businesses that we are there to recover. As I said, a lot of people left um, their jobs. They lost their jobs. They went into subsistence agriculture, but now we want these small businesses, which we are employing between five and uh, 49 people. To, uh, to be revived, and they are getting uh, good interest rates. We are also continuing with our program of EMIOGA, which is uh, uh, targeted at talented groups so that they can continue um, with their vocations. We have money in uh, Uganda Development Bank, which, we are, uh, which is to be lent to, the, to manufacturers who are large and medium at competitive rates. And we are also injecting money in UDC to partner with the uh, uh, private sector, especially in those areas where private sector is reluctant to go alone because they think they are risky. So we are trying to de-risk the economy. We are increasing um, agriculture insurance uptake so that uh, at least our farmers can uh, go into commercial agriculture without fearing that uh, they will lose it all and that the banks can lend to them because they know that there is insurance and in case of any vagaries of weather, they will be able to, they will be able to be compensated. So I think I've talked a lot. I'll stop here for the time being. Thank you so much for listening to me. Another round of applause to Director Moses Kagwa. Um, I was speaking a few words, avoiding creating uh, shortages. I think that's a good thing. And uh, thinking of subsidies somewhere. Unfortunately, you don't know how long the crisis will be, but that will be a good thing. Other countries have tried in the region. Maybe they have burnt their fingers, I don't know. But you also want to facilitate more exports. And uh, I think your message is also a very hopeful message because you can see the economy is expanding. Now at 153 trillion, there's some growth despite the challenges that we're facing. Uh, thank you so much. But the worry is the revenue shortfall of 2.5 trillion that you talked about, I think that's a big worry. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a, a, a panel discussion. Um, I'll give the panelists five minutes each, and after that, we shall have questions, and then maybe um, some solutions that you could uh, propose. But before we go to the panelists, now that the Director of Economic Affairs has spoken, I'm sure it has provoked your minds, and maybe you have a question, maybe you disagree with him somewhere, or you agree, or you think uh, there's something they are missing. I'm going to give about five to ten minutes, and uh, questions from you, so that you can uh, maybe direct a question to him, and then we've got the panel discussion. So please, you put up your hand, tell us where you're from, and make it very precise. We have a gentleman at the back. Can we have a microphone uh, given to him, so that he can, if there is no microphone, I'll share mine. Uh, uh, yes, there is, I'm told. Uh, 
Yes, uh, <clears throat> my name is uh, Patrick Katawazi, and uh, I'm the Executive Director, Center for Budget and Tax Policy. Thank you for the presentation, uh, Mr. Kagwa. But I have one question. In the recently released statement by the Ministry of Finance, uh, in relation to the rising prices, uh, it is indicated that in order to cushion consumers against high fuel prices, government, through the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development, is reconsidering its regulatory role in the domestic fuel market to ensure that price movements are a true reflection of economic environment. Thank you, Mr. Kaka. Is it at this time that government of Uganda is considering capping prices for petroleum products? Thank you. All right. Um, I could take another question or two. Yes, the, the Honorable Ken Luchamuzi. Thank you very much, our guest speaker. I was uh, excited by the remarks you made, and I expected substance out of the remarks, only to see no substantial solution extended to the ground. For example, why has the government not directly addressed the current economic crisis related to the internal hiccups you have talked about, like the war, uh, climate change, and other crises. If it had done so, we would not be seeing that exorbitant budget proposal, as we have noted. Uganda is one of the poorest countries in the world. The majority of the population entirely depend on that subsistence agriculture. Government has spent 37 years in power. It has done nothing about the renewal of product productivity and marketability in regard to the subsistence agricultural products. You have removed the hope we had in marketing our products. Removed the coffee marketing board, removed the coffee marketing board, what do you expect the ordinary people to depend on? What are you up to? You should have cut expenditure so that we would be seeing a budget of about 30 trillion shillings. But you are talking in the context of 47. Where are we getting the money? You continue to invest uh, meaninglessly in the defense. As we speak, about 60 countries outside Uganda harbor UPDF. To do what? Are we at war? What are you up to? Explain. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. And thank you very much, Mr. Kagwa and uh, the colleagues, the organizers. My name is Gerard Rijuche. I work for the Overseas Development Institute. Mine is a simple question to... Kagwa, Mr. Kagwa, you gave all these remedies that government is doing or is planning to do, but what seems to be missing to me, and I didn't get it very well, is the how. The how. You say we are planning to do this, we are planning to do this, but exactly how are you going to do this? A case in point, you talked of um, avoiding creating shortages of essential commodities. That sounds very brilliant. But exactly what is government going to do to avoid this, to, to avoid increment in uh, prices as a result of shortages of commodities? And indeed, as you went through all your responses that government is trying to do, I think for me it was more of like a wish list that we plan to do. But the how element is not really coming out very clearly for me. Thank, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. 
Thank you very much. Political observed. Uh, I just have a simple direct question to Director Moses Kagwa. I remember very well the Minister of Finance established a special committee which was supposed to formulate possible interventions by the government. Sorry, my name is Musoke Thadia Sinagenda, Acting Chairman Kasita, Uganda. And where Kasita was fully represented. And we made several recommendations which the ministry could consider. First of all, we made a recommendation whereby the government has been arguing that reduction of taxes is not applicable. And our suggestion was, let us try. Where possible, where essential commodities, the prices has increased, let us try to reduce on the taxes. For example, the taxes levied on petrol or fuel products. So where we thought that is very applicable. Secondly, we made the recommendation, you find that Uganda will lose over 500 million on a daily basis because of serious jam, and which is impacting on the demand of fuel in Uganda. Why can the government make it a priority to make sure they improve public transport and railway transport, which has a direct reduction on the cost of doing business in Uganda? Thank you. I Thank you very much. Okay, sir, and after we have a lady there, we shall stop at uh, that. Thank you very much. And make uh, it very brief, sir. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. My name is uh, Gerald Pade Auku, and uh, I work with uh, Transparency International Uganda. Uh, I agree with my colleague here uh, who stated that, uh, yes, uh, you made a very wonderful presentation. However, it was uh, uh, limited in terms of um, how, but also timelines. We are aware that uh, we are good in um, uh, making uh, submissions uh, for basically to please uh, Ugandans. But in this particular case, we expected you to have uh, already uh, gone beyond telling us what you plan to do, but also telling us how you're going to do it, but also giving us the timelines. Uh, an example was on uh, shortages. For how long we expect to know this? Ugandans expect to know this. How long will this take? Government should already have a projection on how, uh, on when uh, these particular issues that we are speaking about uh, will end. The other thing you spoke about government allocating billions of shillings. If I got you right, you did say about 300 billion uh, allocated uh, the bank allocated to the banks to support the the small business businesses that could have been affected by but by COVID. Um, I, I still think that uh, there is a little in terms of information flow to the people who are supposed to benefit from uh, this particular fund. But also, how has the ministry, for example, positioned it itself to deal with the aspect of corruption in, in all this uh, intervention that uh, the ministry is uh, undertaking? I expect you to speak on strategies to be able to
All uh, people here for the very uh, good questions. Um, I'll start with uh, Patrick's question. Our government is not going to go into fixing prices of uh, petroleum products. Because if you do that, you're going to create a shortage. I think that's what I was mentioning at the very end, that you should allow in competition. And people are saying, how? But, but by, by continuing with competition and not to disrupt the forces of supply and demand, that is the how, that you'll continue having these goods and as a result you won't have a, a shortage. So what is going to be done on fuel is that you t we, 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 are going, we are looking at the components that de determine the price of fuel, the retail price. And when we look at all this, we see whether the margins that the companies are making are abnormal. And there you can come in as a government and say, no, we can't allow these abnormal uh, uh, prices. We actually, as a Ministry of Finance, we prepared a paper on uh, 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 petroleum prices, which uh, we can share with you, to see the different components. So that will do. Someone says, why don't you move the tax on uh, fuel? The tax on fuel, yes, but you remove the tax on fuel. If you remove 100 shillings of uh, tax on fuel, will the people be happy? Can someone here be happy when 100 shillings is removed from fuel? But do you know what it costs uh, the, the treasury, just the 100 shillings? It is um, two, two, 200 billion shillings. But to, the, to you, it, it doesn't do anything. So how much will government uh, reduce the, the fuel prices or the fuel taxes for, for, for you to have an impact and say, yes, now we can feel uh, that uh, th there has been a reduction. It will not be lower than, uh, than 500, maybe 1,000 shillings. And then the fuel, of course, the, the tax on petrol is 1,450. So how much can you remove? But you, you, you look at the hole you are leaving in the treasury and uh, the burden, because if there is a hole in the treasury, already the budgets have been passed by parliament. We must pay the salaries of people who are there. We must do all these contractual obligations that are there. We must pay the contractors. What will that mean? We must go to the market and borrow. And then who will pay? The people you are trying to save with this... Uh, a subsidiary are going to pay with interest because borrowing comes with interest whereas taxes don't have an interest so that is a choice that uh, a rational government can look at and I think we, we looked at it logically and said I think this is not the right thing to do uh, the, of course there is an issue of hoarding that some people had been hoarding and that was true that's why you saw in some places the price of, uh, uh, of, uh, of soap had actually gone up to 10,000 shillings. But now it's coming down. Because people hoarded, some people hoarded, but because there was a supply coming in, they realized that uh, the, the supply was actually higher than the demand, and the prices have gone down. I want to tell you that now uh, soap has gone down to 6,000, even in supermarkets. So, and some places uh, uh, may be lower. So, uh, those are the things that I think as a, yes, a, a government, we, we, we have been doing to, to look at that. Climate change, uh, Honorable Chamzi, yes, we, we are very serious about climate change. I, I didn't mention it, but yes, it's part of the budget. When you look at the budget, we are taking climate change seriously. Because we as an agricultural country, if we ignore the impact of climate change, then it would be bad. In fact, it's estimated that uh, the countries in the third world are going to suffer from drought and uh, yes in the next uh, 10 years or so so we should really plan now if we don't plan then it will be terrible so i agree with you on that on, on the other issues that we, we we can have more debate 
Look at our budget. Our budget, when you talk about 45 trillion, it's actually not 45 trillion. Because some of this money is uh, money, for example, we are paying back. It's not actually going to be part of the budget. When you look at the budget, it's about 22 trillion. It's not the 47, that 45 you're talking about. The actual budget is 42, 22 trillion. And it's been reducing. When you look at the expenditure as a, uh, as a, a percentage of GDP, we've moved away from 24%. Now we're about 21%. So, sir, we are doing these things. The figures are there to, to look at, and figures don't lie. Yes? And then the military expenditure, well, we, it's debatable, but you know this, the, uh, where we are, the Great Lakes region. And when you go and look into the countries in the Great Lakes region, is Uganda spending more on, uh, on the military as a, as a proportion of its budget? And the answer is no. You can go and look at it. Though we are not saying we should increase, but um, we, we are looking at our expenditure. As a, as a percentage of uh, the total budget, we are actually much lower than most of our, our contemporaries. Um, I think, uh, Gerard, I, try, I, I answered your questions sh showing you the how. Because that's what we are saying. Leave the forces to play. Look at them. Don't allow people to hold, actually, the Ministry of uh, uh, Trade and Industry issued a statement uh, advising people against holding. And we are working with manufacturers to ensure that at least if these goods are here on the market, they are, they are sent to, to the market and... Um, Everybody goes, gets to know that these goods are there. Uh, I've answered also um, uh, Mr. Musoke's question on the reduction of taxes on fuel because you, 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 you reduce that tax, the benefit will be minimal, but uh, the impact on the government budget and on the debt will be very severe. Public transport, yes, we are talking about it. I think there are discussions to ensure that, um, I think you have heard of Tondeka bus company. I mean, there could be issues, but it's something that government is thinking about. And also when you look at these uh, expenditures that we are, we, are, we are now putting in to, to have flyovers, to try and assist at least uh, some of these things. I think you have seen what the Northern Bypass is doing, the Southern Bypass is doing. And so these are the the things that government is doing to ensure that uh, we address uh, most of these things. The timelines on shortages, I wish I could give you that the timelines on, not actually shortages, but uh, increasing, few, uh, increasing prices. I wish I could. But um, I can't tell you for certainty when China will open up. Hmm? It has locked Shanghai, which is a very, very strategic uh, area with 49 million active people industry is producing things. If it's locked up, how will I know when the Chinese will do that? Maybe you can help me to, to get this. How will I know when the Russia-Ukraine war will end? I don't have that. Hmm? I wish I did. I would really tell you, but un unfortunately I don't have. Uh, there's somebody who raised this issue on um, information on the uh, Small Business Recovery Fund. Yes, I agree with you. We have talked with Bank of Uganda that we need to disseminate this information together with the participating financial institutions so that people know what is available. That is really important. I think uh, that is good criticism and we'll take it up. How to deal with corruption, that's a very big um, uh, topic. Uh, what we are doing on our side, at least as the Ministry of Finance, is to try and uh, move uh, procurement, because that's one area that we, we identified uh, from, um, from the ordinary, you know, uh, paper procurement, people are signing this and the other, because when you are moving one paper to this, you are creating corruption, to e-procurement. So everything, uh, everybody, uh, uh, we as government, we to procure, we put our bids there on the e-platform, on the e and people bid and the highest bidder will actually be shown there. So those are some of the things. If we do more of uh, e-government, I think it will go a long way to addressing what we call corruption. But there are other corruption uh, 
agencies of government which we are financing to make sure that they continue with their war against uh, corruption. Um, patience, yes. We have, we, we, we think, we do. You, we, we can, what we should do, let us uh, have you with us and we talk and really get the real uh, solutions. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, A round of applause to Mr. Moses Kagwa, Director, Economic Affairs, Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic uh, Development. And uh, so now, we're going to a panel discussion. The panelists are Professor Pamela Mbabazi, Board Chairperson, National Planning Authority. We have Reverend Dr. Omona Andrew David, Senior Lecturer and Dean School of Social Sciences, Uganda Christian University. We have Mr. Julius Mukunda, Executive Director, CS Bag. And last but not least, we have Constance Kekehembo, a development consultant. So may I now invite uh, Professor Pamela Mbabazi, Board Chairperson, NPA. Um, five minutes, Professor, uh, to speak to us. <laughs> and each of one will be getting five minutes, and I'm going to stick to the five minutes. We'll try. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, moderator. Our chief guest, the Director, Economic Affairs, stepping in for the PSST. Honorable members of parliament present, your excellencies, the heads of diplomatic missions, probably here on, and online. My colleagues from the Ministry of Finance and other government institutions, representatives of the civil society, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning, I believe. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everybody. Let me begin by thanking the leadership of ACCORD for organizing this very important and timely dialogue and for inviting me to participate. Um, as you might already know, among the many responsibilities that the Constitution mandates us to undertake is the responsibility of, of advising the presidency on policies and strategies for the development of the country, but as, as well as liaising with the private sector and civil society in evaluation of government performance. Therefore, my participation in this dialogue is not only relevant, but critical to our function as the National Planning Authority. Now, with that said, let me now turn to the topic of our discussion uh, today, the escalating commodity prices, which is compounding the impact of COVID-19 protocols on our economy, particularly the small biz businesses, as well as the global supply uh, disruptions arising out of the Russia-Ukraine uh, war. As economies start to pick up following the lifting of the COVID-19 protocols in most countries, there has been an increase in demand for a number of commodities. I think the Director of Economic Affairs has elaborated very clearly what the cause of this uh, increase in prices are. In addition to as well as the continuing lockdown in a number of cities uh, like China. So hence, the Institution and export promotion to mitigate these economic shocks occasioned by crises like this that arise out of the dependence on our, economic, on our economy on goods and services produced outside our borders. Now, this import substitution and export promotion policy has been mainstreamed in the NDP3 and other government policy documents. And in line with His Excellency's wise guidance on the economy, that is the real versus vulnerable economy, as well as the buy Uganda, build Uganda policy. NPA has drafted an import substitution action plan that identifies and prioritizes key strategic commodities whose domestic demand should be increased or created. Now, the selection of these commodities are based on an analysis of Uganda's local industrial production capacities as well as the ease with which 
implementable strategic actions to boost domestic production can be taken to meet local, regional, and international demand. Now, the prioritized commodities include petroleum and petroleum products. This is why a huge investment is being made in getting our oil out of the ground. Iron and steel, medical and pharmaceutical products, veterinary drugs and medicines, cereals, plastics, vegetable fats and oil, textiles, salt, fertilizer, sugar, and sugar preparations. The prioritized services include transport, construction, and medical services. Now, as regards the export promotion strategy, government will seek to increase the value and volume of manufactured food products processed from selected agricultural commodities, as well as textiles, cement, steel, soft drinks, and processed minerals and oil to enable the country increase its capacity to finance development. Consequently, the proceeds from the sale of minerals and oil will be spent on the construction of infrastructure to further increase competitiveness, as well as the importation of equipment to drive our industrialization uh, process. Moderator, government has also adopted the parish development model to ensure that not only does government expenditure increase local production of goods and services, but that the increase in economic participation is broad best. Any person willing to work will not be left behind. Government realizes the challenge of increased production without the assurance of sustainable markets. In that regard, government efforts will be focused on increasing and sustaining our market share in five key target markets. And this is particularly the East African community, the African continental free trade area, the Middle East, European Union, and China. And this is where we have the greatest potential. So ladies and gentlemen, government has also increased investment in health and education. And as you see in the budget, quite a number of um, uh, initiatives have been um, focused on to ensure that our young men and women get the necessary requisite skills to work in the industries that we have planned to enable them be employed and that employment is generated and we push forward our industrialization process. So as I conclude my remarks, um, uh, chief guest and uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me once again emphasize that the medium and long-term solution for mitigating against the impact of rising prices and such other economic crises lies in increasing our local production of goods and services for local consumption, but also for exports. To this end, government is promoting import substitution and export promotion policy, and, this will, and, and, and as well implementing the parish development model, plus a raft of other policies and interventions aimed at increasing the attractiveness as you, uh, for Uganda as an investment destination. Government is also investing in health, in education, and in skills to ensure that our economy is sufficiently healthy, it's, uh, our population is competent, and that we have the requisite skilled human resource. So all these interventions, ladies and gentlemen, are articulated in detail in our NDP3 and the different MDA strategic plans, which I'm sure you all have access to. We are not yet there, but I think if we commit, work together, have that positive attitude to make a difference, we can leverage um, all these strategies that we're putting in place to ensure that we attain the change that we desire. I thank you. A round of applause to Professor Pamela Mbabazi. Thank you so much. And uh, you've made it in time. You've made the points and within time. Thank you so much. The implication of the Russia-Ukraine conflict on Uganda's economy. Reverend Dr. Omona Andrew David. The microphone is, is yours now. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Our three directors, uh, Director of Economic Planning, Minister of uh, Finance, Director uh, Alford, and then Director Sesba, the members of Parliament present, my colleagues, the journalists, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, at, at first, when um, 
when the conflict uh, of Russia and Ukraine uh, began, it looked so far uh, because we are far from there, but yet the globe is a village. And, and this mess just came after the COVID lockdown when economies are trying to uh, revive, then this conflict reared its ugly head uh, into the system and spoiled everything for everybody. Um, Russia is, um, is very sensitive in a way of securing its existence its security, economic security, physical security, political security, and security in totality. And as such, China has had conflict with many other neighboring countries that it had, uh, at one time with Poland, at another time with Japan, at another time with Turkey. And then uh, Ukraine, just in 2013, it had to renegade uh, Crimea and took it away from Ukraine because it felt that that place was uh, strategic. And, and the situation in, in Russia and, uh, and Ukraine is affecting the world just because, as my colleagues have already mentioned, Russia is... Um, is, is Russia and Ukraine supply the world with, um, with wheat, with the sunflower oil, with, um, uh, with other industrial products, with oil for Europe and gas, and, and many other uh, items. And, and so the war in Ukraine uh, and, and, and Russia, given the uh, economic embargoes that have been levied, and then also the no-fly zone and so forth that has been put on Russia has turned the situation ugly to every other country that has been uh, in, uh, in, in trade relations with Russia and of course Ukraine by extension. Because one, uh, you can't reach Ukraine, you can't reach Russia because the airspace is already blocked for uh, incoming and outgoing aeroplanes, and also even steamer services uh, is, is a bit of challenging. And that aside, also the West has suspended Russia from the SWIFT code system so that it becomes very difficult, even if you are trading with Russia, it will be difficult to transfer money and also receive money from, uh, from, from Russia. There was an alternative being talked where Russia was negotiating with China, but I don't know how far it has gone. Russia, I mean, China seemed to have developed another uh, international money transfer uh, services. And, and all this has impacted um, uh, on world economy. Um, the other day I was watching CNN, I saw Indonesia suspending production of palm oil for export. And the export suspension meant less palm oil goes to the world market and only supplying for their home consumption. The other day, uh, people in Sri Lanka uh, poured out in the streets and declared their government uh, incompetent. They had nothing to do. They should go home. And uh, on, uh, on Labor Day celebration, those of you who watched uh, Kenyatta saw how, how angry he was because of prices rise in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya. Uh, at one time, I read that um, uh, a, a, an oil tanker was looking for fuel. Uh, somewhere in, uh, in western Kenya, but people thought it was taking fuel to farm. And so they followed the oil tanker for five, five kilometers to go and get oil, but only to find that the oil tanker was also looking for fuel to fuel and go to the next destination. And, and so the Kenyans have been crossing to Uganda to get fuel from Uganda and go back 
uh, to Kenya and, 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 and so forth. And so this, this is an ugly situation, this uh, situation of economic hardship touches all aspects of security. Um, and when we talk of security, we have to talk of security in its totality, uh, where you, 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 mention, you, you have to talk about the economy, the environment, the health, the physical, and the cyberspace, and, and so forth. So as this is happening in other countries, the situation in Uganda is not different. Russia has been supplying Uganda uh, with these food items that just as it is supplying to other countries, and also Ukraine, and then Russia. I mean Ukraine, apart from the food items, the wheat and so forth, they have been supplying Uganda with uh, essential goods, some classified goods that come from Ukraine, helicopter and airplane parts, and, and so forth. And Russia has been taking Uganda coffee, uh, tobacco leaves, and so forth. And, and all this one is now becoming impossible. Uh, just this morning, because I left Mukono very early in the morning, I said, I don't need to come and start yawning here. I went to a restaurant. Then the lady says, I, I, I came with my driver. The driver said, but the, this is not supposed to be like this. The lady says, things have gone up. So now you find a Nakati seller also is feeling the pinch because you buy the Nakati from Nakawa, by the time it gets to Mukono, the transport has uh, um, uh, encroached in your profit. And, and, and so you, even if you get, you get it from your garden, you put it in front of your house selling, you still talk of transport because you, if, if you sell your Nakati, you cannot go and buy any other thing because the price is the other side is 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 on the higher side i i bought some cement at twenty seven thousand uh sometime in 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 january but when i went back to buy in april it had gone to 35 and this time it is around 40 and and, and so forth in the different parts of the country and and so um as prices show as economic challenges are felt across the world, we ourselves here are also not safe unless something is done, which is uh, a, a very, um, uh, uh, it has to be principled a bit. Uh, there has been the talk about uh, putting up the fuel reserve. Uh, it has taken some time. You have a minute, Reverend. I, I, I don't know how far that has gone. So that if we have the fuel, in those reserves, when prices at the international level go up, we can still have something to survive on as we look forward to improving our economy. I thank you. Thank you very much. Round of applause to Reverend Dr. Omona Andrew David. Um, maybe let me continue this side before I go back to, to the other side. Uh, Ms. Constance Kekihembo, development consultant. The DRS is admission to the East African community and its economic implications to Uganda and the community. Everybody's excited. 90 million people have joined the East African community, the common market. But it could, also, it could also be our common poverty. What purchasing power do these people have in this East African community so that we can celebrate? Constance. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And uh, to our guest of honor, the ED of Accord, and uh, civil society budget advocacy, my colleagues, the panelists, and the invited guests, I want to thank you for the invitation. Uh, I must acknowledge that this topic that I was given is an interesting one. And in my conversation, I'm going also to bring in the gender dimension to this topic today in line with the raising of uh, prices, much as I will talk about the DRC issue. And I also am going to focus on what the impact is in terms of gender when we talk about the prices. Um, obviously, it's an excitement to see DRC getting on board. It's a seven-member state now. And that gives us more power in terms of doing certain things in terms of trade. Yeah, for instance, we are going to see more of intra-trade. And that, of course, um, we, it means that we reduce a bit of tension when we are trading with, within East Africa as, as parties. 
and enjoying the, the, the integration principles. Uh, but also, we are uh, excited that this may create an employment opportunities for our young people. Uh, our government has been uh, struggling in ensuring that they can absorb everybody and, and, and we are all working. I see an opportunity of investment and coming from the background of uh, women in trade, we have been encouraging women to invest and, and, and Pamela has just talked about it in the NBA, PA, they are emphasizing the aspect of uh, exportation and substituting it for the importation. Definitely, we have to see the moment of ensuring that there is, uh, there is the deliberate and intentional investment and of course, uh, trying to encourage the women to be part of this uh, opportunity. Uh, when you go back to who is trading at East African level, as we usher in uh, DRC into this uh, space, the women are been uh, at, the, at the lead in terms of uh, 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 cross-border trade, doing petty businesses but matter a lot because we have we know what went through COVID and it was very clear that the women were actually at the forefront of sustaining this economy. Uh, Chief Guest, you've talked about uh, clearly about the issue of subsistence farming and this is where women have been and whereas the men were uh, wondering how to move forward with COVID, the women kept putting the food on the table. And this is the time our government to start investing into this area of ensuring that the women are strong enough to take advantage of opportunities and ensuring that as DRC comes on board, what does it have for the women uh, to continue growing their businesses, to shoulder some of this pricing. If you think about the impact of increased prices, you talked about uh, roundly, uh, just taking an example of soap. Uh, who is doing the washing? Who is doing the cleaning? Even for men, who is cleaning for you? Sometimes you doctor don't even leave that money there, but you expect to put on a clean shirt. So in, you, you, you came up with solutions. They were still generic in nature, but I want us to go down to uh, the thematics and see how do we help this woman to, 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 to cope the shock we're talking about. Uh, much as we can see opportunities as, uh, as DRC comes on board, but there are also mitigation ways of ensuring that the gender aspect is well controlled. Again, uh, when you look at DRC coming on board, of course, it gives us the momentum to take advantage of the African uh, continental free trade area, which has been put uh, for all of us at East African level, but do we have the capacity to deliver? Hmm? Do we have those commodities we can say Uganda is well known of X and therefore GRC will bring this on board, Kenya will bring this on board. What do we have as East Africans? We are now seven member states. What can we put on the table? And when you look at who is sustaining the economy, they are small, medium enterprises. And we are not any different from GRC. Uh, so we are excited of course that, that we are going to increase the demand. We are, we are many now in the, in, in the arena of trade but definitely it also comes in with its own challenges. Uh, Pamela talked about the oil. Of course, that is an area we want to see more of the skilling and skilling the, uh, the young girls and, and, and boys, of course. But when you look at the opportunities in DRC, there's a lot of things that our young people can learn from there in terms of what they've been doing in the mineral sector, in the natural resources, in biodiversity. So there's still a lot of room for us to learn. And um, I think as it gets on board, we also have to see how do we enjoy uh, the, 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 the various opportunities within East Africa and take advantage of that. Um, again, the other key aspect I see is that there is a component of connectivity. Uh, being East African, and, and of course we are seeing that there is some common uh, components from Burundi, Rwanda, uh, and, and Congo, they are French people, and so that also markets us and boosts our, our tourism development in the country. Uh, the last aspect I want to talk about is the aspect of gender. Seriously, when we talk about the pricing, we are, have to address the issue of gender-based violence. Because we are going to trade ourselves to be able to survive. Uh, if we cannot afford to have the food, we have to, uh, to trade what we have. And I don't see in most of the solutions to, from the Minister of Finance, the aspect of gender-based violence being addressed. Uh, whether there is an, op an open opportunity for us to engage with DRSC and, and other East African community players, 
but the gender-based violence aspect cannot allow us to enjoy whatever we are anticipating to enjoy unless it is addressed. And I'll give an example of the study we've done as women entrepreneurs, the aspect of cross-border trade, why women get issues when they are trading. One is the aspect of sexual-based violence. There's a lot of sexual harassment by the officials from Mura A and other board, uh, border officials. And for us, this is a very critical concern. As, as women who are engaged in trade, we must address some of those aspects. I sit on the NTB uh, committee that, uh, that looks into the report that comes within the East Africa community. But it is very clear there's no system in the m &E that captures women who are being sexually harassed. And yet, that itself creates a very big gap. So I would, I would, that's my recommendation, that we need to look at the tools we are utilizing. If, and specifically, women are also going to get um, a benefit or to, to enjoy uh, the, seeing DRC and the rest coming together, trading together, and doing most of the things together. And, and for me, that's, that's what is at task, that until out, we Constance. have addressed that, then we are still uh, on paperwork. I submit. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, I, I like the way how you are, you know, supporting uh, the, the female agenda, make sure they are protected. It's true, there's a lot of GBV in this country, especially uh, women are actually even harassed by the very people who are supposed to protect and love them. You leave alone those who are strangers. Okay, uh, let us now listen from the, the EDCS bag, Mr. Julius Mukunda, the civil society perspective on rising commodity prices. Julius. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll just really try to, to, to add more information on the issues I raised earlier and very quickly to, to, to give the audience time to ask questions. I, I think for me is what can government do? I think for me it is very important. N number one is for me is on strengthening regulation. Let us not run away. Umemo today cannot wake up and increase the price of electricity without the permission of Uganda Electricity Regulatory Authority. That is already regulation. They are regulating the cost of electricity in this country. So we have a model that can be applied to all other sectors of this economy. We need to strengthen government regulation. Already NDP is very clear that the government must come back to doing business better. So let us not run away from that. We can do that. Second is increase production and consumption. And I think I support the chairperson's NPA uh, 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 statement. Increase production and consumption. Why are we importing onions? Why are we importing a mondi? Our people from Kabale can grow the best. But I was informed that the emond, the potatoes that are being imported are those that have no eyes. Somebody can answer that, the one that don't have no eyes. That you should have only one eye, but the emond from Kabale and Mbale, they have so many eyes. <laughs> but why do we have the National Agriculture Research Organization? We pump a lot of money in them. They should be able to help us address the issue of market, because that's what the companies here in Uganda, that's the kind of amount they want. So once we do that, specifically, and, and, and chairperson NP really, we need that. So this is where we want to be. This is the kind of uh, pro production we need. When I see our supermarkets now flushed with so many Ugandan products, because I'm told that the shelf uh, percentage now is around 50%, which I think is very good. That's bubu. That's what we need. Let us increase further so that at least we lessen on the, on, on, on the imports. Thirdly, for me, is the whole question of setting our priorities right. Yes, we have this crisis. To address it, we need to go to agriculture because that's, that's why we have an advantage of getting out very quickly. But the director, when I see that agriculture has a shortage of 65 billion, then I'm asking myself, okay, where are we spending the money? Maybe now we begin to question, okay, how much are we spending on, all other sec on these other sectors? I, I, I think for me, that's, that's why another person is saying, okay, we have a situation, this is how we can sort it out, this is where money should be. So that's for me my major, major area that we, we definitely need to, uh, to look at. Uh, D director, probably for me, I just have two questions for you. 
I think one is, could, could we explain these reserves? Because it seems when we say oil reserves, somebody says they are not there. Others say, oh, they are there, but they are empty. Others are saying, oh, they are there, but they can't survive for, for more than a day. <laughs> okay, whatever it is there, can we get an explanation and probably know, okay, if we can do something, we should do something about it that, that, is, that, that, that is practical. Lastly, for me is, I, I think, uh, Director, one thing probably you could have also mentioned is that, uh, that stabilizing the exchange rate has actually enabled us not to have such a, a, an increased negative effect. Because when you have a stable exchange rate, it's a, it's, it contributes to the stability of oil prices. But if it's up and down, going up all the time, uh, definitely oil prices, fuel prices are likely to increase even at a, at a very high price. But considering that for, I think for big, almost since this year started, the exchange rate uh, has really been very stable. And I think uh, we thank um, the Bank of Uganda really for ensuring that uh, that, that, that happens. And I think it probably could one of the areas to ensure that we have a stable exchange rate to ensure that uh, uh, we, the prices, especially for fuel, uh, do not escalate a lot. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. A round of applause to, uh, to the panel. And uh, so we are reaching the moment where you have to have your say as well, even ask questions. I'm getting questions also coming online because we have an audience online. I can hear from you there's a passion to invest in agriculture more. And I think agriculture is our area. I, I don't think the ministry people, whoever is responsible, I don't think there are people who do not care. But may I say, maybe you don't get it. Because really, <laughs> that is the place. I know you care. I know you love this country. I know you're working hard. But just turn a little bit to where the energy should be. OK, um, let me begin. There's a representative from the small Federation of Small and Medium Scale Enterprises, at least a representative. A, oh, Casita, uh, okay. You spoke already, Mr. Misoke. <laughs> okay, yeah. Very, a minute, by the way, if you can. Uh... Hello, my name is John Walugembe. I represent the Federation of, micro, of Small and Medium Sized Enterprises. SMEs are the backbone of this economy, and when such things happen, they are hit the most. We speak. I, I was in Arua, I'm going to Fort Porto, and businesses are being stretched, high cost of transport, high cost of inputs, a very vigilant URA, because URA wants the money, staff expecting salary raises, consumers who are not willing to pay more for the same kinds of products. So you are stuck in what the English call a cul de sac. You can't go in front, you can't go behind. Now, Mr. Director, you said, uh, first of all, your presentations, I thought, were good. They diagnosed the problems correctly, and we agree that this inflation and high commodity prices are driven primarily by external factors. And I also agree with Madam Chairperson on the issues of import substitution. I'm happy you now have an import substitution action plan. Give it to us so that we start implementing, because if it's stuck, if it's stuck in NPA, then we have an, an issue. Let's see how, let's see how, <laughs> no, our SMEs are not on right. Let's see how we can work together to make this happen. The other issue is competition. And Mr. Kungo talked about regulation. For me, I talk about the competition. We need the competition authority in this country. Why? As a country, as consumers, we want to know that we are being charged the correct price and there's no additional foul play. So if we don't have a competitive, because today we are talking about fuel com commodity prices, but there are other sectors that we feel ought to be well uh, regulated. Finally, the, on the issue of no subsidy, no tax. Mr. Director, I agree with you, no subsidy, but you can create a token reduction in taxation. For instance, you talked about the issue of 200 billion. Let's not assume that our expenditure should remain the same. We can cut down on expenditure and then use that to give back by saying we have given you a token reduction. And oh. that, that's a good thing. Thank you. All right. Me. Thank you so much. Um, by the way, uh, the, the country representative for IMF, Isabella, is attending online, is, is with us. And we have a big audience that is online as well. They are sending their questions. If the time allows, I'll be able to, to, to at least uh, read some of these questions.
Yes, I had many hands. Um, yes, sir. I thought I would talk for like 10 minutes. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> but, Unfortunately, there's only one minute. <laughs> but now uh, I'm going to, to interrogate three areas. Can you step this side so that at least the people who are viewing you but on briefly, television can see you? But briefly, mm -hmm. that is to mitigate the COVID, the COVID uh, impact on the economy. I want to represent today the local person, the ordinary person. Omuntu Awansi. Omuntu Awansi. Okay. What does that Omuntu Awansi think? You know, we go into these conference rooms and talk and talk, good talk, uh, good dialogue. But what does that man, does he understand what we are saying? To help this old man, this old man, the ordinary man, uh, we, I want to look at three areas. Education. Because if the education is expensive, this person will have to take his kid to school, whatever the cost will be. So how do we mitigate that? How do we help this man to remain with some little money to reduce on the cost of education? One, I think uh, the director was saying taxation. You know, with education, the schools, they tax buildings, they tax uh, salaries, they tax uh, food, they tax whatever is in it, electricity, subsidies, there is no subsidies. So we should look into that. But even then, I want to ask Mr. Director to help me here. We have government-aided schools and private schools. The government-aided schools, government gives them grant. Government pays teachers' salaries. Government builds infrastructure for them. Government pays all overhead costs in those private uh, government-aided schools. In the private schools, nothing is done there. But when you look at the, the, the fees we pay, the child in the government schools will pay three millions, and the child in the private school will pay three millions. The owner of the private school can even go ahead and invest more and build more schools. Where does the money here? Where does it go? Okay. So, Mr. I wanted the director to do this. Yes, yes. To do this. You have asked a very serious question. Yes, to do this. And, uh, I want you to reduce, uh, you tell the, the board members to take over those schools. Collect that money that you are sending there, re, re, uh, divert it, give it to these uh, seed schools, for example, to help this, this parent. Um, yes, sir. Th thank you so much, sir. <laughs> and and, and that I, have, I have an interest in that question. <laughs> Why are parents paying more in a government-aided school than sometimes a purely private? Does it even make sense? Okay. And, There's a lady at the back. Please take that microphone. Thank you so much, uh, the moderator, Mr. Kagwa, and the panelist. Um, this opportunity is uh, something that we have been waiting for. And I want to speak for the voices of the locals and the women, specifically. The issue of price that we are talking about right now, we shouldn't just look at it as a supply and demand issue, but we should look at the impact this is taking down to the household level. At the same time, we are going to have a situation where we are seeing social cohesion in households going to again to what it was during COVID-19. We are going to see blame games in families as men and women are blaming one another for failure to supply in the household. We are going to see livelihoods affected to the extent that people are no longer going to school because we do know that things like bars of soap, sugar, and now local schools are also asking for children to go back with beans and maize in, in, in school. So at the end of the day, the kids who are not Is going to go back so? to school as, yes, okay. in villages. So school time will come when people are failing to access education due to this. So my prayer to the government is that we need to handle this not just at the business as usual, like the solutions you have given to us. If you say we are supporting farmers, 
right now to grow more crops, it sounds like almost what we have been doing. If you're trying to create still competition in demand and supply, it's what is already happening. So no tangible solution has been brought to this. So even when the PDM is in place, you'll realize a time will come when people will fail to invest in the economy, but instead utilize the money that is given to them to sustain their livelihood at household level. So in, other way, in either way, we, shouldn't, we wouldn't have made any progress. All right. So in this, I call upon the government, mostly strengthen the legal policy and institutional framework, especially the issue of food reserve. We, it is something that we should take into concern as for a farm. For, All uh, right, your time, your time is up. Th thank th you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not going to take any more questions. We are 10 minutes behind the schedule. And uh, so there are online questions. Where did the East African Railway project and the construction of ports end? I think it would have solved much of the transport problems. This is from Jackson Mukibi, who's on Zoom. Aaron Ainomi just says, let's fill the accountability gaps and address the question of systems and structures. And Christopher Ngolove, you say, what is government doing to ensure that the Small Business Recovery Fund is received by the rightful beneficiaries? I know some of you had only comments. Uh, there are a few questions. No question directed the panelists. So I'm going back to Director Economic Affairs to respond, and I'll give the panelists, each one of them, 30 seconds to give, submit finally. Mr. Kagwasa. Uh, thank you, Patrick. And um, thank you, um, audience, for these wonderful questions. Uh, first of all, let me answer the last one, um, the Small Business Recovery Fund. As I said before, it's uh, housed in the ministry, in Bank of Uganda, and uh, the money only goes to the commercial banks uh, to lend out when they have appraised these small businesses and uh, submitted this appraisal that this is ready for uh, lending to Bank of Uganda. So there are st very strict and stringent uh, uh, requirements as done by the, by the, uh, on the agricultural credit facility. And when we see the agricultural credit facility, there is almost no abuse because of the systems that have been put in place. So this is a, a replica of what is going on there. I agree there was an issue about filling account accountability gaps. Yes, we should discuss that more because we all want to be transparent and accountable and sure that there's value for money, for the taxes that we collect, and for the money that we borrow. Then on the East African Railway Project, we have a lot of uh, regional infrastructure projects. And, uh, of course, we thought that we would have the railway, the standard gauge railway from um, Mombasa right up to Kampala. But uh, uh, it has not uh, moved from, uh, from Kenya because there, there, there is a gap there that must be filled and Kenya has not yet got the funding. But on our side, we are, we are renovating. Actually, on the Kenyan side and both on our side, we are renovating the meter gauge railway which will mean that at least our goods will move from, uh, from Kenya by rail all up to uh, Kampala, and then we are also doing Tororo and Gulu, so that at least we can um, reduce the cost of uh, doing business in that way. We are also looking at uh, uh, Mwanza, because the Tanzanians are bringing the standard gauge rail up to Mwanza, then we'll move um, the cargo by, uh, by water up to Port Bell or up to Bukasa Port when, when, when it's ready. And from there, we just need a standard gauge railway of 13 kilometers from uh, Port Bell to Kampala. So those things uh, are going on there in the uh, pipeline. On issues of um, gender-based violence, as a result of increasing prices. I, 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 I note that, but I think we need, I don't know what government, as we said, can do to those prices. 
because the solutions on uh, the solutions on uh, subsidizing are not sustainable. So we, we need to educate and sensitize our people uh, as NGOs, the civil society organization, against some of these uh, vices. Um, there was an issue on education that uh, we are supporting. There are some government-aided schools. So we will stop financing or aiding them. So we don't have that anymore. That support ceased. But uh, when you talk about taxing food, um, I just want to know which food we are, being, we are taxing. And I would be very happy to address it. Because uh, all unprocessed foodstuffs that is used by uh, educational institutions, it's free. Unless you are talking about cooking oil, which I wouldn't take as a food, but uh, if it's there. But the food, the basic food, is not subject to taxes. And um, taxing buildings, we tax building materials, not buildings. <laughs> Sorry? The what? School buildings. That is KCC, I mean local authorities, when they are taxing their property taxes, but um, not central government. So um, taxing salaries, yes, teachers like everyone else pay, make a small contribution and pay as you earn. It's not the schools which are paying, it's the, the teachers. The schools only withhold. I think those are the questions that uh, I had. But, oh, oh <laughs> he had a question for me on, um, on, on fuel reserves. Yes. Right now, our storage tank has, uh, tanks in, uh, in ginger can take about 5 million liters of fuel. And uh, even if we fill these, uh, these reserves, they will last us for only... Uh, six, six days. So I don't know you can those uh, reserves really really? have a reserve for six <laughs> days. Thank you. Okay. Six days of reserve <laughs> for the country. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Kagwa. And uh, I think now, I know most of you have questions, but an issue of time. It's not that I don't want you to talk. And, and we also maybe wasted about 30 minutes before we could start. So let me give the panelists 30 seconds, and I mean 30 seconds, okay. your closing arguments, okay. uh, in the order how you spoke earlier. Okay. And then I will call upon David Walakira to come and summarize the key issues and invite uh, Dr. Benom Jisha to come and conclude. Thank you very much, moderator. I really want to extend my sincere appreciation to all um, um, individuals that were able to make comments. And these have been very well received. I think that as NPA, we will take um, all these brilliant contributions and churn them to see what is applicable. Having said that, I think two things I want to emphasize. The import substitution action plan has been completed. We will popularize this and we will work with all stakeholders to ensure that we do it right. And two, I think the issue of competition, uh, Mr. John, um, I think that uh, true, some sections of the private sector have brought to the attention of government the fact that some foreign private investors are colluding to disadvantage locals, and government has put in place a cabinet subcommittee to address this issue, and soon government will be pronouncing itself uh, on this particular issue. And as I indicated in my um, remarks, the selected commodities have been agreed on regarding uh, import substitution and export promotion, and implementation action plans uh, are being put in place and, and let's really have a positive attitude to work together. I think as a country, we can make a difference. COVID has taught us that we have to look inside. We have to try and work together to deal with the challenges we're facing. And I'm very excited and pleased that as civil society, you're taking this uh, in, in, in view of, of what is going on so that we work together as one country, as one government, to ensure that we make a difference. I thank you. Thank you, Professor Pamela Mbabazi. Uh, Reverend Doctor. Yeah, thank you, members, for listening to us. And uh, what I take from this uh, Ukraine-Russia relation or their conflict is that um, uh, many parts of the world are still at the periphery of peripheries in terms of uh, economy 
and uh, um, uh, political marshals, uh, which is why the confusion that is there has ripple effect to all parts of the, uh, of the world. And as a country, I think uh, Uganda is that which we have. Uh, we need to avoid blame games, just like in other countries. We need to handle this together, uh, hold the bull by the horn, and, and see what we can do in our small way so that we make the country a better place for all of us instead of blaming somebody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Constance? I'd like to... Uh, first of all, as DRC gets on board, it's very important that everybody is aware of the opportunities that come along with that and deliberate uh, uh, sensitization on the procedures and the protocols engaging in trade uh, at East African level. Because people are not yet aware on the privileges when you go into trading as East, as East African community. But also on the aspect, uh, our chief guest, I want to draw back your attention on the SMEs uh, being financed by the, the different various bodies you've talked about, there's still a challenge of information gap, how it is packaged to the user, because we have seen women investing in more money to get the little money. So again, that is not, not, not helping them to get out of where they are. And maybe finally for us to engage into this shock is to see how to add value to, the, to, the, to agricultural products, because it is the easiest that we can, we can deal with value addition on agricultural products so that everybody can be able to continue engaging in trade. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mukunda. Uh, thank you so much. I, I think for me is to, to, to say thank you for, for, from, for NPA and, and, and Ministry of Finance that we can come on the table and talk about the challenges we face in this country and that we can talk about it op openly and also honestly. Because like one person said, this is the only country we have. And that as civil society, we are all, all interested, all of us, interested to have, to have a better Uganda for ourselves, for our children and friends and, 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 and everybody else. Uh, thank you so much, uh, DA. We, we fight a lot, but we have our good fights. We are all, you know, we are all interested in one thing, for a better Uganda. And thank you for bringing us on this table, especially the Minister of Finance, to target these issues. Thank you so much. All right, uh, a round of applause to our panelists and our keynote speaker. Um, I'm sure, Mr. David Walakira, you've been capturing some of these things. So if you can just give us a summary, and after that, invite Arthur to conclude our, our dialogue this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick. Uh, I've captured some of the key highlights in terms of government action, but also some of the key asks uh, that the panelists did have for us. And um, at, after that, I will um, invite uh, Dr. Arthur to give us closing remarks. From the submission of the um, representative of the PSST, uh, the Director of Economic Affairs, Mr. Kagwa, about the issues of the prices and the uh, performance of the economy, uh, some of the, of the um, key actions the government is uh, doing or planning to do. One is to maintain a competitive environment for the supply of imported items, but also avoid creating more shortages. And that high prices, but with steady supply, is a better outcome. Yeah? So subsidies are good, but we can't afford them. That was a key highlight coming through. But there are issues around um, ability to forecast when the crisis will end, when will the lockdowns in China stop, uh, when will Russia stop uh, being aggressive against Ukraine, and things of the sort, makes it hard amidst a debt crisis. We've hit the ceilings, so the room to wiggle is non-existent or little as such. So, but government is dealing with aspects of wasteful expenditure, and we have 1.6 trillion shillings that has been repurposed in the budget for 2022, 2023 that we're going to see. But there are also no tax increases for the financial 2020-2023, which, which should be a, a signal uh, to the market uh, to do, uh, spend, and plan as such. Government is continuing with the interventions of EMIOGA, uh, interventions through UDB for the larger players, but also UDC, and also 
agriculture is still um, important, uh, as uh, noted with the interventions around um, not only the agricultural credit facility, but also agricultural insurance uh, coming through uh, there. Um, since NPA is part of government, I've captured the key action around the import substitution plan is ready, and um, implementation action plans are underway. Okay? We have to look inside. <laughs> okay? And I think um, those are some of the highlights that I've picked in terms of actions that government is uh, picking up. But there were asks from the panel and the, and, and the, and, um, the participants, physical and online, strengthening re regulation has come through uh, loud and clear, and we have a working model, the era model, and how it deals with umeme, and uh, possibly there is also a model in Kenya. Besides, with or without this crisis, the Kenyan government does not let uh, their fuel prices go where they want. They use our umeme model to deal with their fuel, so I think that's something that uh, we can learn, and it's an ask. There was one about increasing production and consumption, uh, and um, there was linking tightly on to uh, the import um, substitution uh, action plan that we have and questions around why we're importing Irish potatoes, why importing onions uh, didn't come through uh, clear. But then also uh, I thought um, uh, DA, uh, increasing consumption could possibly be something that we want to tweak our VAT. So then when we lose possibly value but we can get it back in the volume of, um, uh, as, as part of the increased consumption, then we get the markup of what would have been uh, the lost uh, value from uh, a reduced VAT uh, as a way to uh, boost consumption. Priority is getting set right. If not agriculture, then what? Th that still has also come through. And I, I think um, one that I've smuggled onto the list is implement plans and budgets for better results and outcomes. I thank you very much for attending and listening. At this point, allow me to invite uh, uh, Dr. Arthur, the ED Accord, to give us some closing remarks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause to Patrick Kamara, our moderator. A round of applause to, to the Director of Economic Affairs for being honest and frank, uh, but uh, answering uh, at the House. Uh, what they are going to do, but uh, not yet telling us what they are going to do. Uh, he still has a lot uh, uh, on his table, but also a round of applause to our panelists, very able panelists, chairperson, uh, 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 National Planning Authority, Professor Pamela, Dr. Mona, and Constance. Thank you very much for speaking to us from the heart. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, just to add on what my colleague has just captured, agriculture is still relevant. Uh, in these times that we don't understand, and actually it's our backbone and the fallback position, so we need to invest in agriculture. And actually we still have to engage the permanent secretary uh, who still thinks the country cannot develop through the agricultural past. I think countries can develop through the agricultural past, and Uganda has endowed us with that one. We have to engage in that discussion. Uh, finally, the DR Congo, I think, ladies and gentlemen, is an opportunity for us, but country serious countries that are knowledge-based, like Uganda, need to do an uh, opportunities mapping. We need to do an opportunities mapping what we are likely to get from Congo. There are a lot of opportunities. I was telling Mukunda just left. Inga Dam, Inga Dam in the Congo, on River Congo alone, can produce over 10,000 megawatts of electricity and can pump industrialization in the, in the region. We need, yes, the entire continent actually. It is more powerful than actually the, the Renaissance Dam or the Millennium Dam that's being constructed and contested in, the, in, in Ethiopia. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, especially the Minister of Finance, I think we need to go back on the drawing board and the National Planning Authority and see what we can actually get from the Congo. Of course, for a long time, Congo has been a sleeping giant of Africa. And now that Congo is part of us, we think the guns will be silenced. That is very, very critical. And I know when the president of Rwanda visited and they had that main discussion, one of them is a common security strategy for the region to silence the guns. Once the guns are silent in Congo, we can, we can exploit opportunities. That Congo has a lot of minerals that could power the industrialization of the continent. So that is very, very, very important. But finally, ladies and gentlemen, is that for once, let us be a knowledge-based economy, 
knowledge-based economy, not just reactive in terms of interventions, but proactive. Let us engage in these discussions. I want to bring the support of ACCORD as a think tank uh, to you, uh, Minister of Finance and National Planning Authority, that we do research and we use this research to make our, our, our decisions. Let's really, for once, do our best, be based on that. Apart from that, I want to thank, thank the team at ACCORD uh, that are led by Wariakira. Can you give them a round of applause? A team at CS Bag. I've, I give them a round, CS Bag, our partners, and they have also put money together. A team at the Ministry of Finance, led by Shaka, you've done us proud. And for once, you can see civil society and the government, once we work together, I think we can achieve a lot. And for you, the audience, the participants, the Ugandans out there, I want to take on Mona's wisdom that actually we have one country called Uganda that we love, and if we work together, we can actually make this country a better place. Thank you very much, and may God bless you.